Hello, I am Dane DeFebo, the museum educator of the National Civil War Museum here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I bring to you this captivating story of the American Civil War on the 159th anniversary of the Battle of Second Manassas, Virginia. This captivating story relates to the role played by Union Major General and Fifth Corps Commander Fitz John Porter in the Battle of Second Manassas. Here's what we know about Second Manassas. It was a major tactical victory for Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army of Northern Virginia against John Pope's two-month-old Army of Virginia. And it also dealt a significant blow to the overall Union morale as the Confederate forces drew closer to Washington, D.C. Prior to launching this campaign that would culminate in the Battle of Second Manassas, President Lincoln had selected his friend, General John Pope, to lead the newly formed Army of Virginia. Pope had had some minor military successes on the Mississippi River, but these successes were not against the best Confederate field commanders, the likes of men such as Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and James Longstreet, whose commands were found in the Eastern Theater. The Lincoln administration selected Pope to command the Army of Virginia in an attempt to threaten Lee's forces from the north and draw attention away from General George McClellan's Army of the Potomac, which had become stagnant on the James River following their very costly defeat in the Peninsula Campaign. Likewise, at this time, McClellan, a man fueled by his own ambitions, had become ever so mistrustful of Lincoln and his administration and had sought war aims and objectives different from the commander-in-chief. Fitz John Porter, the commander of the Union Fifth Corps of the Army of the Potomac, found himself in a difficult position prior to the Battle of Second Manassas. He was one of General McClellan's closest friends and allies in the chain of camp command and Major General Porter's command had just been reassigned to General Pope's Army of Virginia. General Porter already had a negative impression of Pope and his abilities, and he made his opinions known in telegrams to Ambrose Burnside, who in turn revealed Porter's views to Union leaders such as Secretary of War Edwin Stanton and President Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln especially had disdain for Porter's views of General Pope. In the events leading up to the Battle of Second Manassas, Porter had been receiving panic-laden, repetitive, and unorganized orders from his new commander, General John Pope. However, on August 29, 1862, 159 years ago, today, Fitz John Porter made some battle decisions at Second Manassas that would come back to haunt him as they resulted in the November 1862 arrest, removal from camp command, and guilty verdicts in a January 1863 court-martial that would have him dismissed from the army and forever disqualified from holding office of trust or profit under the government of the United States. In the court-martial, Porter was charged with making two violations of the Articles of War for his activity or lack of activity at Second Manassas. Five specifications were outlined that General Porter had disobeyed lawful orders from General Pope. On August 29th in particular, Porter did not move his Fifth Corps toward the nearby town of Gainesville in the morning. In the afternoon of the 29th, Porter did not attack Stonewall Jackson's right flank as ordered by Pope and Porter failed to commence an attack on Jackson on the evening of August 29th. Porter also only sent one brigade to the town of Centerville, Virginia on the night of August 29th, whereas Pope wanted Porter to send his entire corps. Additionally, General Porter was charged with four specifications of misbehavior in front of the enemy. Three of these specifications were linked to Porter's efforts on August 29, 1862. Porter was accused of not engaging or making an effort to engage Stonewall Jackson's right flank as ordered to do so on the afternoon of August 29th. He was also charged with falling back on August 29th 
while knowing that his core was needed, and while being aware that Pope's attacks were failing, thus leading to the defeat of the Union Army and subsequently placing Washington, D.C. in jeopardy. Pope was charged with moving slowly and not making a complete effort in his attack the following day on August 30th, 1862. Though General Porter had pled not guilty and had support of his subordinate officers, Ambrose Burnside and the conservative Democratic political allies, such as his own defense attorney, Reverdy Johnson, the cards were stacked against General Porter in his court-martial proceedings. Porter was considered to be an arrogant disciple and prodigy of an equally arrogant Union commander named General George B. McClellan. After the conviction, Fitzjohn Porter immediately attempted to clear his name and have the rulings overturned. He meticulously surveyed the 2nd Manassas battleground and with the support of McClellan and other friends petitioned famous figures to write letters on his behalf an attempt to address the Republican biases of the court. Unfortunately for General Porter, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton intervened and blocked the government efforts to reinvestigate the matter, even having Porter's supporters in the military punished. Likewise, the press painted Porter as a traitor as well as a coward. When the war ended, Porter made another attempt to clear his name by writing Generals Lee and Longstreet for their assistance. In this letter here on the table, received from General Robert E. Lee and sent in the last year of his life on February 18, 1870, Lee asserts full confidence that Union battle plans would still have failed even had General Porter had been more aggressive in the Battle of Second Manassas because of, in, of intended actions of Longstreet and Jackson to protect, protect the Confederate battle line. Fitch John Porter also gained support from Ulysses S. Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman, and George Henry Thomas in the early 1870s. This led to a new commission headed by former Union General John Schofield being appointed in 1878 by President Rutherford B. Hayes. The Schofield Commission determined on March 19, 1879, in a report to President Hayes, that ju justice requires at the President's hands such actions as may be necessary to annul and set aside the findings and sentence, and restore General Porter to the positions of which the sentence deprived him. Additionally, the report found General Porter guilty of no wrongdoing at Second Manassas on August 29, 1862, and even credited Porter for saving the Union Army from an even greater defeat. Despite the findings of the Schofield Commission, political opposition from radical Republicans prevented Fitz John Porter, a Democrat who was deemed traitorous by the Republican press from being reinstated in the Army. However, Fitch John Porter found some allies from other presidents, such as Chester A. Arthur and Grover Cleveland, men who had no political stake in these legal proceedings. In, 1860, in 1886, President Cleveland would restore Porter to his regular army rank of colonel with no back pay given. Just two days later, Porter would retire from the army, exhausted from all of the proceedings that took place in efforts to clear his name. I would like to thank Stephen J. Pahalik for sponsoring this captivating story of the American Civil War. And I'd like to thank you for listening to this captivating story. Please go to our YouTube channel where you can view other videos like this. And please like our page, um, which supports our museum. Thank you.